myself to you. Reverence being respect and honor, giving him the glory and the attention that he deserves. Being in complete awe of who God is, is, is understanding his greatness, his vastness, his awesomeness, right? How awesome is our God? How wonderful, full of wonder is our God? It is focusing on those things. So to fear God is to love what God loves. It's to hate what God hates. It's not just to dislike sin. It is to hate what he hates. Hate that sin. It is to, to fear God. It is to depart from all manners of evil. Whether that's with thoughts, with our actions, with our words. To fear God is to give everything back to him. To fear God is to tremble before, his, before him and his word in wonder and awe. Right? It's to give his presence and the word of God our fullest attention. 
To fear God is to obey Him immediately, even when we don't understand why, even when we cannot see the benefit for us. To fear God, it, we, Scripture tells us that the fear, a healthy fear of the Lord, leads us into more happiness, and it actually gives us the strength that we need to live our everyday lives. Here's the aspect that I want us to focus on this morning. That the, to fear God quite simply means to me, this is where I am moving into a whole other realm with the fear of the Lord. To fear God is that we would fear not being in His presence. That we would fear not being with God, not enjoying who He is. This is the best way I can describe it to you. My wife is the queen of analogy. She shared this in our group the other day. And I thought this was outstanding. It was definitely a word from the Lord. But, but think about the fact that we've all lost loved ones. And when you lose a loved one and they're on their deathbed, we will, do, we will put everything aside and we will rush to their bedside and sit at their side. Because we fear being without their presence. We fear not being with them, and so therefore, that fear of, of not being able to hug them, not being able to talk with them, not being able to communicate with them, not being able to be close and near to them, that fear of that causes us to grieve, and therefore, all of our daily priorities change. It doesn't matter what's happening at work when you've got a loved one on their deathbed. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. You will move and, and move mountains to get next to them because you want to make sure they know how much you love them, how much you care for them, how much you want to be with them. Correct? That is how we need to begin to understand what holy fear is. That holy fear is fearing not being in the presence of God, not being able to talk and communicate with Him, not being able to feel His comfort and His warmth and His embrace as Abba, as Daddy, as Father. Holy fear is like, it's just like when Moses says in Exodus 33, he's like, hey, if, if your glory is not going to go with this, if your presence isn't going to be with this, don't move me. Don't move me from this place. Holy fear is a fear of not being with God, not being in His presence, not being connected with Him. We have two categories of holy fear that we're going to break down throughout this series. The first is tr to tremble at the presence of God. The second is to tremble at His Word. We're going to begin to look and unpack what it is to tremble at the presence of God. So here's my first point. Four points today. The first point is this. That we will only find God's manifest presence in an atmosphere where he's held with the utmost respect. The only way we get to be in his manifest presence, we'll explain that in a minute, is when we walk in an atmosphere where there is total and ut of utmost respect and offerings and fear and love for him. That is the only way we get to experience that. Leviticus 10.3 says this, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. He didn't say it was a good idea. He didn't say to come to, to be in my presence that you ought to think about my holiness, regarding me as holy, or to glorify me. No, no, he says, if you want to be in my presence, I must be. I must be regarded as holy. I must be glorified. That's the only way you get to come into my presence, is to do that. And you may say, well, wait, I, I thought that God, that God's presence was everywhere and that he would never leave me or forsake me. Well, let me just tell you that, yes, you are correct. That is true. But that Scripture talks about two different types of presence. There is the omnipresence of God, and there is the manifest presence of God. The omnipresence of God is what David wrote about in Scripture in, one, in Psalms 139. 
In verse 7 he says, where can I grow from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. It's what Hebrews 13, 5 says, that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That is the omnipresence of God. That is his presence that will always be there. But that is not the manifest presence of God. Jesus talks about the fact that there is another presence, this manifest presence. In John 14, 21, he says this. He says, who, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him. And I, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Christ, the Messiah, the one that's come to save you, I will manifest myself to you. That word manifest there means that he will make, his, make himself known to you. He'll reveal himself to you. He, he's not going to hold anything back in that moment. This is the idea. Manifest presence is the idea of bringing the realm of the unheard into the heard. The realm of the unseen into the, the seen. That is who God, he says, I will manifest myself. You will experience me in your five senses. You will, like on the day of Pentecost, they saw the fire, the tongues of fire come upon one another. They heard the wind. They felt the presence of God. Now, I know there's a lot of people who come to church. They're faithful. They come and they say, well, I, I, I don't ever experience God's presence. I don't, I, don't, I don't experience His presence in church. I don't experience it when I pray. Can I just give you a check here? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's because you don't walk in holy fear before Him. Is there still sin in your life? Have you, have you surrendered everything to Him? Are you in complete obedience to Him? Do you understand his greatness and his vastness? If we don't check ourselves and examine ourselves, we're never going to be able to experience the manifest presence of the living God. He wants to manifest himself to us. If you have your Bibles, turn to me with Exodus chapter 33. It's kind of where we'll stay. We'll start here and we'll come back to this. It is so vital, it is so important that you and I learn to walk in the manifest presence of the living God. It is something that we can experience. It's something, it is the tangible presence of God that you and I can experience regularly. Exodus chapter 33, beginning in verse 15. Moses says to God... <laughs> Moses, who is a friend of God. Moses, who is in the presence of God. You see, because Moses didn't withdraw on the Mount Sinai last week, right? Because he didn't withdraw, he went into the presence of God. He now can say to God, if your presence does not go with us. God is telling them to move on. He says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then... Will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except if you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all who are upon the earth, all who are upon the face of the earth. Moses is saying here, hey, the only way that your people, the children of God, are going to be seen as separate and different from the rest of the world is if your presence goes with us. It is the only thing that is going to distinguish us from the world. Is that the presence of God is with us. Paul writes it and talks about it this way. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, You are the temple of the living God. He's speaking to you and I. That we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We were talking at the manifest presence. We were talking about a dwelling presence of God, not a visiting presence. 
There is a difference between a dwelling presence and a visiting presence. It's the same presence that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 18. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be in your midst. He's not talking about the omnipresence there. He's talking about the manifest presence. I will manifest myself there. I, I will manifest myself to you. It's not the everywhere presence of God. It is the manifest presence of God. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Are we two or three? Yes. Then why should we, are we not experiencing the manifest presence of God? Do we lack holy fear? Do I lack holy fear? I would say yeah in some areas. Something I'm working on. I believe we're all working on that. And I think that's what the Lord is trying to teach us in this series. That we can experience His manifest presence. That He wants to show us in our five senses. He wants to reveal Himself to us in a mighty way. This is the presence where Moses again says, if, our pre if you don't go with us, I don't want to go from here. Because it's the only thing that's going to separate us from the rest of the world. If you and I want to experience something that we've never experienced before and go places and encounter God in a deeper level, if we want to see the moment that we experience presence, the manifest presence of God, our lives will be radically changed. We'll be radically changed. Which leads me to my second point. That the fear of the Lord changes the atmosphere. If you need to take pictures, I know they're long, take pictures. The fear of the Lord changes the atmosphere. It cultivates an environment for the Holy Spirit's power to change our lives and the lives of others. Psalms 89.7 says that, that God is to be greatly feared in the presence of the saints. In the assembly of the saints, that, that God is to be greatly feared and to be held in reverence by all of those around Him. You see, when we begin to fear the Lord, when we begin to come together... As a people, people are going to walk into this building when we come together in holy fear. When people walk into this place, people are going to get saved without any effort. Chains are going to be broken. People are going to get healed and be set free from addiction when the manifest presence of God is in the room. This is the presence of God that went with Peter and Paul. And when they walked down the street, their shadow cast upon people and healed. All were healed. It is because the, they walked in the manifest presence of God. It's what, they, what Scripture in the New Testament refers to as walking in this walk by the Spirit, right? It is walking in the Spirit of God. It's walking in the Spirit of God. Let fear rule and reign in this place. But you and I have got to start to practice and seek this on a personal and intimate level before it maybe ever happens corporately. One of the things that I've been, I've, I'm challenging you to do is I'm challenging myself to do is when I go into my prayer closet in the mornings, as I, as I rush in, to be, as I go to be in his presence, I don't go in anymore asking him for something. I'm not going in doing all the talking. I'm not going in singing and praising. It's good to go in with thankfulness. We enter His courts with praise. But what if we go in, what if we go in and we just ponder how awesome and how wonderful our God is? What if we just ponder that He is from everlasting to everlasting. What if we just think and focus on the fact that He is God Almighty, yet He wants to be Abba, Father, Daddy to you and I? That alone should blow our minds. That alone should cause us to sit and just awe that the Creator of the universe wants to be in our presence. He's inviting us into His presence. He wants a relationship with us. How awesome and wonderful is our God. That is the challenge that I think that each of us on a personal level need to go into. If you want to experience the manifest presence of God, you know, so many times we struggle. 
We struggle to get in His presence. We struggle to feel that He's near. Maybe it's because we're doing too much of the talking. Maybe it's because we're directing the conversation. Maybe it's just we just need to ponder how awesome and wonderful He is. Which leads me to the third point. Our holy fear grows proportionally to our comprehension of God's greatness. Our holy fear grows proportionally to our comprehension of God's greatness. The more we understand how great God is, the more we learn to walk in holy fear. And that holy fear will grow. You know, it came a point in time in, in history when Israel, when God said to Israel, To whom do you compare me? Who is my equal? Who, who are you comparing me to? You know, when I was growing up in, in day and age, I was a basketball junkie and nut. I, I loved that sport. And there was one guy, there was a certain NBA player who was idolized by all. He, he was considered the god of the court, the king of the court, Michael Jordan. And people were in awe and enamored by this guy because he could palm a basketball in one hand, he could jump from the 15-foot free throw line, and he could dunk a ball. And he was idolized. There was posters and shoes, and his reputation is still in state intact today. I mean, he is still thought of to be the best player ever lived, and he's idolized. He was idolized by kids all over the United States, all over the world. Well, what if, in that same manner, you and I became enamored with the greatness of our God? Hang with me just for a second here. Think about our ocean. Think about the waters that cover this earth. That 71% of the earth's surface is covered by water. Did you know that every drop of water, the entire vastness of our ocean, oceans and depths that have not been explored or gone to, that people don't even know about, the entire amount of water that sits on this earth was measured in the palm of God's hand. Isaiah chapter 40. It says that the heavens declare His glory. That the heavens declare the glory of God. How long do you think it would take you and I to fly on a jet airplane from here to the sun? Traveling at 500 miles per hour, it would take us 21 years to travel to the sun. Do you know that our closest star in our Small galaxy, the Milky Way here, is 4.3 light years away. The closest star, if you're wondering what a light year is, it's the speed of light, of how far light travels in one year. The speed of light is 670 million miles per hour. It takes us 21 years flying at five on one of our planes, one of our fastest jets to get to the sun. Light from the sun reaches us in 8 minutes and 20 seconds. The farthest star that you and I see from the naked eye is 4,000 light years away. 4.3 light years away would take us 51 billion years to travel in a plane to the nearest star. 4.3 light years away would take us 51 billion years to travel there in a plane. 4,000 light years away when we see and compare it and look at that light when you walk out into the night sky and you see the light that is traveling from that farthest star that we can see with the naked eye you are looking at light that left that star about the same time that Abraham and Sarah got married <coughs> Science says there are billions of galaxies out there. How they know that, I have no idea. But yet, on social media and every mainstream piece of media, all media that we have, every we, we dote and brag and idolize athletes, musicians, Hollywood stars, the rich, the famous, the super wealthy, we idolize them. We brag and idolize on them, right? And it actually is taking away from us to be able to encounter the awe of God. 
I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate their accomplishments, but what I am saying is we need to keep it in perspective. The fact that a man can palm a basketball and jump and dunk a basketball is no comparison to a God who can hold the waters in his hand. When somebody says that they, they, that this person or that person is the goat, right, the greatest of all time, well, can I just tell you that Jesus is the greatest of all time? That he, Isaiah declares that Jesus, God Almighty himself, he measured the vast universe, the vast universe with the span of his hand. From his thumb to his pinky, he measured the vast universe. Solomon says that the heavens and that the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, O God. So we have to ask ourselves a question here. Are our thoughts of God casual? Are they just common? Or are we dwelling on his vastness and his greatness and his glory of who he is? Are we in awe of the creator? You and I need to get a holy perspective, a holy fear of God, and keep our reverence and our awe of man in check and in perspective. Which leads me to point four. The glory of the Lord is everything that makes God God. The glory of the Lord is everything that makes God God. All his characteristics, his authority, his power, his wisdom. Literally the immeasurable weight and the magnitude of God. Nothing is hidden and nothing is held back when it comes to his glory. You see, the closer that you and I move into the presence and into the glory of God, it's the glory of God, the light that shines, that then begins to cleanse our soul. It's his presence that will cleanse you. You can't do it on your own. You can't stop sinning. But when we move into his presence and we focus on the glory, the light that's shining, the light that will one day blot out the sun and the stars, everything else will become dark and only the light, the glory of God will shine and illuminate here on this earth. It's that light that will cleanse your soul. It's that light that can break the chains of darkness in your life. 1 Timothy 6, 16 says that Jesus, our God, who alone has immortality, he dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to, to whom be honor and everlasting power. You see, no man can walk and live in the presence and the glory of God. Can't, we can't see it. We can't live in it. Go back to Exodus here, 33. Look at verse 18. Moses says this, he says, God, please, please show me your glory. Show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. When Moses says, show me your glory. That word glory there is the Hebrew word kabod. It is the word that means abundance, splendor. Show me your reputation. Show me your dignity. Show me your riches. Show me your weightfulness. Show me how substantial you really are. It's the full, I want to experience the full weight of your presence, God. The full weight of your being. God says, I, I'm going to cause my goodness to pass before you. Now Moses asked for the glory, and God said, you can't handle my glory, but I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. And that word goodness there means the good in the widest sense. He says, everything that makes me me, everything that, that, that who I am, that's what I'm going to allow to pass before you. He said, and when I do, I'm actually going to hide you from that, because if you were to look on my face, you would die. He said, you're only going to be able to see my back. You're only going to be able to see the glory from the back. You see, those that, that see God in their glory, like John. John saw him in the spirit. He didn't see him in the body when he was exiled. 
And he sees the glory of God in Revelation 1.17. He falls down like a dead man. This is the man who was the friend of Jesus. Who reclined at the table with Jesus. Who, who knew him as friend and savior. Who knew him as the Messiah. But when the king... When the one with all authority and splendor and majesty and the glory of God Almighty Himself walked into the room with John, John fell down like a dead man. This is the same God who Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, He says, Woe to you sinners! Woe who the, to those who would call good evil and who would call evil good! Woe to you drunkards! And then he experiences and sees the glory of God. And he says, woe is me. I am a sinner and I am undone. I am like a dead man in the presence of God because of my sin. When we get that kind of understanding of his glory and his vastness and his goodness and his presence, he will manifest himself to you. He will cleanse you. He will heal you. He will set you free. We understand that He holds our universe in the palm of His hand. How great is our God. How awesome is our God. How wonderful is our God. He is greatly to be praised, greatly to be feared, greatly for us to walk if we want to see and experience His presence. We want the manifest presence of God in our lives. It's time we stop living life for ourselves and surrender to the one who hung the stars. It's time that we surrender and give our all, our adoration, our praise to the one who measured every drop of water in the palm of his hand. It's time that we bow down to the one who can be, who you and I can behold in our hearts. And you and I, who 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that, that like an, we are being unveiled. Our face is unveiled. It is almost as if you and I are beholding the image and the glory of Christ as in a mirror. As if we were looking in a mirror because you and I are being changed into the image and the glory of Christ. That you and I are being changed from glory to glory. Do you know and understand that that same glory He wants to impart into your life? That's who our God is. A God that loves you so deeply that He gave everything up for you. He became a man in flesh. He died on the cross for our sins. He said, I'll pay their debt. I'll take their place. I'll have that terrible judgment and the entire wrath of God come upon me so that they can be our children, Lord. He himself, Jesus Christ, it was his delight to walk in the fear of the Lord. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet it's his delight to walk in holy fear. And you and I are called to imitate him. draw closer to him will you chase after and pursue him will you pursue his glory will you cry out to the holy one show me your glory you just sang about it a few minutes ago did you mean it show me your glory Lord maybe there's some of you in this room who have never surrendered your life you've never said yes You've never said, I'll follow Christ. I'll be his disciple. Because of the great debt and price that he paid for me, if you have never said yes to following him, you can bow now 
are one day every knee will bow before him in eternity. If you have never said yes, I'll follow you, accepted the invitation where Jesus is saying, come and follow me. If you've never truly surrendered, maybe you've raised a hand before, but maybe you've not ever walked in holy fear. If that's you this morning, don't hesitate, don't wait. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Is that you this morning? Have you surrendered to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Have you said yes to following the one true God? Have you said yes to walking in holy fear and reverence? If there are any here who would say, I need to surrender my life, I want to give my life to Christ this morning, if that's you, would you raise your hand? like me maybe you need to repent this morning of not dwelling in the presence of God because we've never taken time to explore his greatness to ponder and think on his greatness if you would say I need to repent I've had a lack of holy fear if that's you this morning and you're like me would you raise your hand I want to pray for you Father God, I come to you now in prayer, Lord. I praise you, Father, that, that hands are going up all over the room, Lord, that people want to walk in holy fear before you, Lord, that we want to understand your greatness and your vastness. Lord, we ask, Lord, just like Moses, Lord, show us your glory. Lord, I pray that you would reveal your goodness to us, that you wouldn't hold anything back, that you would reveal it all to us, Lord. Lord, we don't want to walk in fear of man. We don't want to walk idolizing man and being enamored by them, Father God. And, but we want to fear not being in your presence. God, we long for you to manifest yourself. Lord, you said when we would repent and walk in holy fear, Lord, you would show yourself to us. God, as we sing your glory, as we sing praises to you, Lord, God, I pray that in this next moment, in this next minute, Lord, that you would let your presence come down. Let your glory fill the temple of those who walk in reverent fear before you. Just like you did in the days of Solomon, you feel your glory fill the temple. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come, that you would manifest yourself to us. We pray that we would experience and feel your presence in this hour, Lord. God, we're crying out with desperate hearts. We need you. We need you, Lord. We need more of you, Lord. We need you, Holy Spirit. We're desperate for you. We're desperate for you, God. Glory. 